So today um, we are going to talk to you all about children's books, um, specifically a couple of children's books from our focus countries. Um, but kind of to get started and to get y'all thinking about the origins um, of different books you may have read as children, um, I'm going to show we have a PowerPoint and I'm going to, there's um, some titles and pictures of children's books. And so I want you all to tell me if you think that they are from the U.S. or not. Um, and if not, where is it from? So I guess let's, let's do it this way. If you all, so for the first book, let's say if you think it's from the U.S., give me a thumbs up. Um, if not, thumbs down. And then maybe one or two people come up and say a country that you think it might be from if you don't think it's from the U.S any guesses are acceptable, um, just to kind of get y'all starting to think about this. All right, so let's see. First, okay, Hansel and Gretel. Do you all think that this book is from the U.S., is American, thumbs up, or from somewhere else, thumbs down? Can you hear me? Are they frozen? Oh yeah, they're frozen, okay. okay. There we go. All right, can you, sorry, can y'all do that again? Y'all are frozen for a minute. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs, okay, I see a thumbs down in the front. Do you have any guess as to where it might be from? Where the book might actually have been written? Um, no, well, okay. I think it's like Africa. somewhere, maybe in Russia. Because it sound like okay. a name. Yeah, any other guesses? Um, I would say Poland or Germany. Okay. All right. So it is, it's a German book. It was written in Germany. Um, and then obviously later translated um, for us. Okay. And what about The Little Mermaid? U.S. thumbs up or somewhere else thumbs down? Got some thumbs up. Okay. This is kind of a surprising one. I was surprised by this too. I didn't know um, until recently. The Little Mermaid was actually written in Denmark. It's a Danish book. It's not um, not originally from the U.S. either. All right, we have some more. What about Pinocchio? U.S. thumbs up or somewhere else thumbs down? Let me see some thumbs down. Okay, so any guesses as to where it's from? Um, <laughs> Melvin said, Melvin said Italy because of the way that it sounds. You're exactly right. Good job. It is from Italy. <laughs> okay. And what about Anne of Green Gables? U.S. or not? Okay. See some thumbs up. So Anne of Green Gables was actually written in Canada. Um, close, but definitely, but not American. So it's also interesting as well. Okay. Um, what about Peter Pan? U.S. or out of the country? Okay, I see some thumbs down. What? Uh, any guesses there? England. England. You're exactly right. Well, you're, you're good at these. <laughs> okay. What about Tiki Tiki Timbo? This is one of my favorite oh, books. Definitely, Africa. definitely thumbs down. Okay. I heard Africa. Any other guesses? A lot of people said Africa. Okay. Tiki Tiki Timbo is actually written in China. It's Chinese um, children's book. I know that. <laughs> okay, we have two more, I think. Let's see. Um, so 1001 Nights, um, it's, this is actually a compilation of a bunch of stories, um, but it also includes Aladdin. So just for reference, uh, Aladdin, do you think thumbs up or thumbs down? All right, see some thumbs down. Where do we think that one's maybe from? I, I was thinking like somewhere in the Middle East or maybe like from all around the world since it's a collection of different Good, exactly, yes. Yeah, so it's um, this, this whole, the book as a whole um, are a bunch of stories and is a bunch of stories and folk tales um, 
from the Middle East and South Asia. And so they were originally written in Arabic, which is kind of interesting to think about. Aladdin, you know, it had to be translated. Um, and they were compiled during the Islamic Golden Age. Okay, and then the last one, um, Peter and the Wolf. U.S., thumbs up or thumbs down? Africa. Okay, it's Peter and the Wolf actually is from Russia, was written in Russia. So this was kind of, um, you know, just to get y'all thinking that you know, all these stories that we you probably read as children um, or m might be familiar with, um, they're not originally written by American authors. Um, and, and there's different cultural aspects that go into them as well. And so now Sean and I are going to talk to you all about um, some children's books from our specific countries. So I'm gonna start and talk to you all about Strega Nona. Um, just out of curiosity, is show of hands, who else familiar with um, the story Strega Nona? Anyone? Okay, I see a few hands. All right, so um, I actually have a video for those of you who are not familiar, I have a video that is a reading of the book and shows the, um, um, hope you all enjoyed that little story. Um, so a few of you said that you were, that you were familiar with it. Just, I know it's kind of a silly story, but how many, what did y'all think of it? Did you enjoy it? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay. All right, um, so now we'll talk a little bit more in depth about it. Um, there's, there's definitely some cultural aspects, um, some Italian cultural aspects that you can find within this story. Um, and one of the big ones that stood out to me was the centrality, um, like the importance of food in the story. I know probably, as y'all have noticed now, um, in most of my presentations, food ends up coming um, coming up, and that's because it is a big part um, of Italian culture. Um, it's a little bit, I guess, I guess you could say it's a little bit stereotypical that it's pasta, um, but pasta is something that's eaten every day, um, and and you know that's kind of right at the center center of the story. Um, but then additionally, I kind of want to give you all some some historical context um, that can help us understand the cultural, some of the cultural meanings and significance um, that you can find in Strega Nona. So if you remember at the beginning of the video, at the beginning of the reading, it mentioned that this story is set in Calabria. So if you see on this map over here, um, that red region, it's kind of the toe of the boot, um, that's Calabria. And so it's one of the uh, southernmost regions of Italy. Um, and Calabria has a, a history um, of being one of the most poor regions as well in Italy. It's like most of the South, it's an agricultural um, focused uh, region. And it, um, I guess with economic development, everything, it just uh, has not developed as quick as the North, and, and so they have a history and still kind of, I guess, have a reputation of being one of the most poor regions of Italy, struggling with um, poverty and lack of food and resources. Um, in fact, my, so my host father in high school, I lived with a family, and my host father grew up in Calabria. Uh, he was one of six children, and um, you know, it was, it was normal for him to have one meal a day. Um, that was kind of, you know, he started working at a young age to try and help his family out, but that was, that was typical, and that's a typical Calabrese family. Um, and so knowing this historical context also kind of adds to the cultural um, importance, the fact that food is at the center of Strega Nona. Um, there's this magical pot that can... Uh, can provide food for anyone um, that's kind of kind of just an interesting um, cultural and historical uh, thing that I noted noted in this um, in this children's book 
And another thing is um, kind of the idea of superstitions and magic. Um, so strega means witch in Italian. And so obviously this is in, talks about the potions that she makes and, and solving problems and things. And um, Italians in general um, have are very superstitious people um, and and a lot of their stories uh, you know relate back to magic or um, kind of folktale type stuff and so again you see this in this children's book um, that's not just things that adults say or whatever it's, it's kind of spread throughout the culture um, and so there were just those were just a couple things that are interesting to to look at from a broader cultural perspective. Um, and then in addition to cultural meanings, um, now I kind of want to talk a little more about the author's purpose. So, you know, why did the author um, write this book? What message or lesson uh, was he trying to get across? So I kind of want to ask you all, do you all have any ideas, uh, kind of what's the main message of this children's book? Have a couple people come up. <laughs> to do what you're supposed to do. Like when you're asked, when, um, the, when something is asked of you, you need to follow it. Yes. Okay, any other ideas? Oh, yeah, there maybe one more student. Okay, I kind of felt like basically <laughs> the author was just trying to teach the lesson to listen, and there are consequences for every action. Good, okay, yeah, so just like what you all said, um, a few of the kind of broader lessons that I picked out from Streganona are lessons on greed and obedience. So uh, like you said, doing when something is asked of you, doing what you're supposed to do. Um, and so Big Anthony, you know, he saw that this pot was magical and that he could give him pasta. Um, Streganona also repeatedly told him not to touch the pasta pot because she probably knew what would happen. Um, and he didn't listen out of greed. And then, you know, there were definite consequences. He almost drowned the town in pasta. Um, and then his, his personal consequence was that he had to eat uh, his way through, through a bunch of pasta. Um, and so this is kind of where I wanted to kind of draw, draw a parallel, a similarity between, um, between different cultures with children books. Um, children's books are often a spot um, to teach lessons, you know, and, you know, when you're sitting down with a five or six year old, you can't just tell them not to be greedy or tell them to obey. Um, and so that's where the importance of, of children's books comes in. And I would take a wild guess that if you sat down and, and if you had a collection of all your children's books um, that you used to read, you're going to find very similar lessons um, within those. And so, you know, each culture may use culturally appropriate material. For example, what we were talking about earlier, the use, you know, it makes sense to use pasta in Streganona. Um, but the general ideas that, uh, that cultures are using using these children books to teach lessons, um, which is kind of an interesting, interesting thing to think about. Um, so now I'm gonna pass it off to Sean. She's gonna talk about some more, um, some books from China, children's books from China. So um, going off of what Emma was talking about with children's books and um, just stories that are told, um, I'm going to focus on folk tales, um, especially the four great folk tales of Chinese history and Chinese culture. Um, these per se might not have the same um, uh, lessons in them or ideas that were just spoken of, but there are different uh, purposes that these uh, folk tales do have. Um, so they're a little bit different from like the book that we just read and some other ones we looked at in the very beginning. 
um, but they do add to the cultural aspect of China. So the four great folk tales, um, I'm, I just have two slides showing you kind of what they're called, um, but I'm gonna only focus on two of them. So the first one's called the Butterfly Lovers, second one, the Legend of the White Snake. Um, the next slide, uh, third one, the cowherd and the weaver maid, and then the last one, Meng Jiang weep over the, weeps over the Great Wall. Um, so first I wanted to go into kind of what are folk tales in the next slide. Um, uh, if you can find a partner or just you yourself, if you want to do this on yourself, if you can answer the next three questions um, in the next minute or so, and then we can go through each question. So find a partner right now, or if you want to do it yourself, you can write this down or mentally um, within the next minute or so. And if you're done with discussing these three questions, just raise your hand and so I can get the gauge if everyone is done before the minute is over. Okay, so are we gonna start with the first question? Yes. Okay, awesome. Okay, so a folktale is a story that gets passed down from one family to another and you know, a generation to another generation and yeah yeah awesome um if emma if you just like click next something yeah i just kind of played with the animations a bit but that's pretty much it yeah it's like a traditional story or legend that is passed down generation by generation um and it's usually orally retold or like told by word of mouth instead of written form and that is how it's able to be passed down generation to generation um, and then also to keep in mind with this uh, storytelling way of passing down these folk tales, there's probably a lot of multiple ways that these stories are retold because there isn't a direct written um, book or written story about it. And even with written stories, you've seen multiple different uh, same story outlines, but written in different ways. Maybe um, there's like extra character in some of the stories. Um, there's an action here and there that was not done. In, so they're each um, retelling of the story might be told differently depending on the person and how you heard of it. Um, and then what is the purpose of a folk tale? If someone else wants to come up and answer that. Like to teach, <laughs> like to teach a lesson, like all of them have a moral, you know, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, can you click the next? Yeah, so folk tales tend to have, like you said, a lesson of life or um, a theme, a universal theme that you talk about, like obedience or um, honesty kind of thing. But it also can explain for certain aspects of a culture. So like it can explain for um, a reason why a culture believes a superstition or a reason why um, this structure in this culture has been there for so long. Um, so the, the stories that I'm going to be focusing on tend to really focus on this uh, explaining a certain aspect of a culture or idea that a culture believes in, kind of. Um, and then finally, the last question, what are some characteristics of folktales? So what do folktales include usually? What are the characters like? What's the story like? If anyone wants to come up and answer that. Um, one is the facial feature animal. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, don't they usually feature animals in this, like, not being animal to And also, usually, the, um, the animals have, like, human characteristics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything else? Uh, is 
said that uh, sometimes they will involve supernatural activity. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. Oh, is there another one? Okay. Um, I saw that like older folk tales show like how something like started or came about. Yeah. Yeah, like a tradition or something, how that started. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, those are all right. Um, down here, yeah, magical events, supernatural characters or animals. Sometimes usually the animals are able to talk or like communicate with humans. Um, humans have special abilities or there's like um, gods or goddesses coming up from the sky and um, all that stuff. Um, and archetypes and such go into these. So yeah, everything that um, you all said does come into this. Okay, so now we've kind of defined and understand what a folk tale is. We can go into the folk tale. Uh, the two that I'm gonna focus on, um, and we're gonna watch a video as well. Um, the two that I'm gonna focus on in the next slide um, are the butterfly lovers and the Mengjiang weeps over the Great Wall. So the first butterfly lovers, if Emma, you can just go skip to one minute in. We y'all got both the stories. I know there's parts of it that were kind of um, volume wise didn't work and they talked really fast, but pretty much um, the butterfly lovers included, uh, it's kind of the Romeo and Juliet, as people say, um, of uh, Chinese history and storytelling and then Meng Jiang in the end I'm not sure if you all caught but like when she went to go find her husband it turned out that her husband died of exhaustion from building the Great Wall and that's why she was weeping for three days um, and then her like the amount of tears that she was weeping um, caused a dent within the wall and like bricks to fall off and such but um, if you can go to the next slide Okay, so um, with those two stories, with how what we just uh, talked about with folk stories, like the purpose of the tale and what kind of characteristics it had, if you can find a partner again, um, take a bit and those two stories that we just looked over, if you can find out like what was the purpose of it and um, if there was a purpose or if there was a cultural aspect con um, connected to it, and uh, what were the characteristics um, of the two stories? And also, while you're thinking about this, I would strongly encourage you to think about how are these characters portrayed um, and what kind of like stereotypes might be added onto these characters. Um, so once you're done, you can come up and let me know what you think. I learned that true. I learned that true love prevails. That's what I got from that. Got you. Yeah, like the um the butterfly one. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then I learned that love causes pain. Oh my god. Nice. That's a good yeah, that's a good thing to get out of it. Okay. Well the characters. Anything about um I it's kind of hard to pick up, I think, unless you've um watched it a few times or if you've heard the story a few times and thought about it truly. Um but like how were the how was the female character portrayed? What was she able to do? What was she not able to do? Um what was like what kind of person did the story really say females should be like or such? Well, from what I got from both stories is that both of the females, they kind of couldn't go on without their male. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this idea of like, um, I need someone to save me. I need a male to be there for me kind of thing, um, kind of theme going on. Um, and both of them are crying at some point in the story. Um, the second one causing a whole like building to fall off. Yeah. 
Um, and also in the first one, I'd like to point out that um, culturally, it also shows kind of into the culture of the past where um, women are not supposed to pursue education back in the olden days. Um, and so in order for the women in the first story to be educated, she had to pretend to be a male. Um, and that was her own way of getting education. Um, and for the second story, oh, okay, for the first story, so like the purpose of the story or what kind of uh, themes you got out of it or um, cultural aspects of it. Um, well, since that story has been passed down for generation to generation, butterflies, um, that ex that's why um, the explanation for why butterflies are kind of always dancing and together. Um, and every time, usually Chinese people who have heard the story, who um, have been in the cult, who understand the story's background and such, whenever someone sees two butterflies dancing, they always are lured to that story and like think back to that story. Um, and there has been multiple plays done about it. There's been a whole musical concerto done about it. Um, so it's been very inspiring in like the love, typical love story inspiration wise. The second story, um, the purpose or kind of like the culture aspect they take out of it is um, they kind of um, have that story to explain why the Great Wall of China has some breaks and some crumbling parts of it. Um, but obviously I, <laughs> it's impossible for a woman or someone to cry so much to break a whole wall, but that's just kind of the story that's behind it. And that's what people say. Um, but yeah, so those two were just um, two of the four great folktales of China. If you're interested, you can look into the other two folktales, the one about the white snake and the other one about the cowherd and the maiden or the weaver maid. Um, they're both very interesting, very much um, kind of has uh, superstitions that come out of them that Chinese people kind of follow or think about. Um, but now we're gonna go into our um, discussion after thinking about both what Emma presented and I, and after thinking about both what Emma presented and I presented. Um, and we're gonna turn to a partner and discuss what you learned, what surprised you, again, what any questions you have. And then while you're discussing this, think about it in the sense of like the purpose of the stories um, that we presented how the characters were portrayed and how could that be a possible danger maybe, um, how they're portrayed and um, how these stories reflect on the culture and the importance of the culture. Um, so take the next minute or so to think about that. And then once you're ready, you can come up and answer the questions or just tell us something that surprised you or another question you have for us and it can just be an open discussion. Does anyone have anything that they'd like to share? They can be. They can be too sexy to die in. Was that the bell to switch class? No. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone want to come up and just talk about any questions they have, anything they like to share that they learned today? Um, why do you think the people always just, just, um, portray, yeah, portray the females as weaker characters? 
That's a great question. Um, and Emma, if you want to answer this as well from your knowledge or anything. But um, I, it's very interesting because um, even till today, China's uh, way of treating the two different genders um, are very different and it's very hierarchical and it's very patriarchal. It's very male-based. Um, and so throughout history, like these stories are probably told by men um, and from the men's perspective and how men view the women. Um, and because uh, men always have had the power in Chinese culture, um, it was most likely that men were the people who were telling these stories and passing these stories on. Um, and so that kind of goes in not just for the Chinese culture and Chinese stories, but if you think about today in like America or honestly any other um, cultures in which the male is the more dominant, um, per, more dominant gender with the more power, um, that's what it usually is that the female is portrayed in this docile very kind of weak needing to be dependent on others um yeah so it's very important to kind of like keep that in mind when you're reading these stories and um kind of take it to take it as a grain um what's that saying a grain, grain, of, salt. A grain of salt kind of um knowing that this is only one perspective um and that they're everyone is very complex and not binded to just one stereotype or anything that's a great question, though. Yeah, that is a good question. Anyone else? Uh, so, so, you said that like, kind of, the um, thing was that, like, you know how, in, all, in both of these stories, the women would be kind of, like, weak-ish, kind of dependent on a man. Do you think that these stories have, like, affected how it is in the time of the day? Yeah, um, I think stories always affect how we perceive um, who we are and how we interact in the world. Like, even with Emma's story, like that kind of stereotype of the old woman who provides or the old woman who's cranky, you know? Um, so that very much, I think, does play out in how Chinese, um, the Chinese culture and how women do portray themselves. and. Um, you do see that even till today, even when we have the more like, pro there's more progression and there's more equality, there is still those old traditional thoughts or old traditional aspects that um, still very much like brought up there. For example, like the idea of um, being married and trying to find someone to be married. Um, in China right now, there's this phenomenon of, it's called the leftover women um, in which these quality, single, young, successful women um, are deemed by the government as leftovers because no one wants them or no males want them and they can't get married. Um, so there's this negative connotation around these women who, like in my eyes at least, should be praised for what they've done. Like they've gone through education, they've found great jobs, they're single, they're young, they're beautiful. Um, but yet, it's like the culture has, and the traditions have limited them in their view. But Emma, if you want to continue on with any of that. Yeah, just, I mean, as far as Streganona goes, um, I mean, yeah, I think these these children's stories definitely portray, um, or kind of, you know, create Im certain images in our mind, like what Sean was saying with um, uh, Streganona, the kind of old, cranky one, like, you know, kind of, like, I guess the the a little bit of a difference is she she is a strong character and she's the central or one of the main characters um in this book but she's she's the old witch with the the big nose and um and you know casting little spells over her magical pot um and those are again you know, things that we see tied to the culture and tied to traditional values um, that you can find in other parts of the culture. Um, and then, you know, you see them in children's books as well, which is uh, just shows how widespread and, and it kind of keeps those, that's what keeps them moving forward as well too, even, if, even though we had, do have progression as well. Good questions. Any other 
Anyone want to share what they've learned from either stories? Um, how it's connected to that culture per se, or any other questions? It's honestly up to y'all. You kind of determine this ending, how you, where you want to take it, and what you want to discuss. Um, I might have heard this wrong, but in the story that Nona won, um, the storybook like had kind of a negative on food because the area that it's from like kind of has some problems with food. Is that right? Sorry, can you repeat it? There's something wrong with the volume a little bit. Um, you said that in the straight that no in the book. I might have yeah. heard it wrong, but it was um the book put an emphasis on food because like the area was kind of struggling with food, right? Yeah, that's um, kind of, I guess, what I was going for there was giving some historical context. Um, so yeah, yeah, the area has has traditionally um, been one of the poorest in, in Italy. And um, yeah, so exactly there, that's um, just kind of this cultural and historical overlap that you see all throughout, um, that you see in the ch children's book, which is, you know, that's a that's a big problem to, you know, to have poverty and you're not necessarily trying to, um, to teach children about that, but the fact that it's present there um, gives you a little bit of insight into the culture and the cultural importance of the book. So yeah, good. That's exactly right. All right, well, we can um, wrap up here. Um, I guess just, you know, to kind of, go over, review what we talked about, and hopefully learn today. Um, you know, it's important to be um, aware of the origin of stories. Um, you know, obviously, we're specifically talking about children's books, but all stories in general. Um, and, they're, and to think about their cultural significance. Um, as we saw, it can kind of change how you see a story or um, give you some insight into the culture and some values um, that a certain country or culture may have. Um, and, and, you know, also can give you some history um, into it all. So these are all just kind of things to keep in mind um, to make sure you're, you're looking at the broader picture again, kind of almost connects back to the single story thing. Um, um, it's important to think through these things and, and learn about them so you're, so you're getting the full picture. And I think that's, that's it for today. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah, thanks for the awesome questions and participation. You guys are great. <laughs> Bye.